to talk about what a p-value tells us. Any statistic that we use in psychology, t-tests, ANOVAs, correlations, chi-squares, all these things, um, it's going to spit out, the computer program, a p-value. Now p, you can think of it as probability. All these statistics are based on probabilities. So, you know, p less than 0.05 we know is a good thing. We're always looking for p-values that are small, and typically anything less than 0.05 we're going to be happy with. Now I want to talk about what this stands for, this 05, 0 0.05, 5 hundredths. It's 5%. This 0.05 is the same number as 5%. Okay? Now, what that 5% represents is if I get a small enough p-value, less than 5, less than 5%, I'm going to say my experiment worked. That means my independent variable actually did something. It caused a change in my group, whatever treatment group, and I could see the change on the dependent variable. Right? So the number of words that was remembered by group two was significantly higher than the number of words remembered by group one, the average number of words. And I'm drawing that conclusion. Now because of the way numbers work and our statistics work, even though I'm, I'm making that claim, there's always the chance that I'm wrong. There's always the chance that it wasn't actually the independent variable that caused that change in my groups but that it was just some sort of fluky thing. So like in our memory experiment, maybe it just so happened that in group one, even though I use random assignment, for some reason, people with, re you know, a bunch of people with good memories ended up in group two, the one that had the higher scores. Or maybe a bunch of people in group one were really tired, they, you know, had an exam and they pulled an all-nighter and they just weren't focused and they performed terribly and that maybe my groups were not equivalent to begin with, not necessarily through sampling error, but it just, or that would be sampling error, or, sam you know, there could be bias, but for whatever reason, maybe it just kind of came out looking significant when, in fact, my IV didn't have any effect. So, knowing this, we always have to make these very kind of, you know, provisional statements about, um, drawing conclusions. And so now I want to talk about the null hypothesis. I want you to think about what the word null means. Null and void. What is that? Null means zero. It means nothing. Not zilch, zippo. Ain't there. Okay? So in the terms of research, the null hypothesis is saying your experiment did not work your independent variable had no effect. It did nothing to the dependent variable. Nothing happened. Now obviously that's not what I think is true or I want to be true. So there's the null hypothesis and there's what we call the alternative hypothesis. Now a few people actually use the word alternative hypothesis. They'll just say my hypothesis is exercise decreases depression. Um, so when they're talking about, they'll talk about the null, which is the idea that nothing happened, IV does nothing, and then they'll just talk about their hypothesis. So if now, back to that p-value. If we get a p-value that's significant, this 0.5 or whatever we decide is our cutoff, what that lets us do is reject the null hypothesis. Now think about it. Rejection is good. We're rejecting the idea that nothing happened. We're rejecting the idea that the IV had no effect. Now, if we reject the null hypothesis, we don't then accept the alternative. Because remember, there's a 5%, sometimes a 3%, 2%, 1%. There's always this little chance that we're wrong and the IV really wasn't responsible. So knowing that we might be wrong, instead of saying we accept the hypothesis, we say our data support the hypothesis. We reject the null, we support the hypothesis. I think a good thing to kind of write in your notes that will help you remember is put, um, put a smiley face and you're happy if you can reject the null. Now this notation for the null, I put a capital H with a little zero. That's uh, just a way of writing the null. So reject the null makes you happy. That's the same thing as saying you support the 
alternative hypothesis. For that, I just put a capital H with a little sub one to denote my alternative. That's great, and that's if your p-value is less than alpha. Alpha is the cutoff you put. Alpha is usually 0.05. If it's not mentioned, you assume it's 0.05. Um, but there are situations where people might set alpha a little higher, a little lower. We'll talk about those. But if p, if p is less than alpha, you are happy, you reject the null, you um, support the alternative. Now, if p, however, is greater than alpha, so maybe we'll put p greater than alpha, then you're not happy, and you fail to reject the null, and you fail to support the alternative. So rejection is good, failing is bad. So we're going to put a little sad face, say fail to reject null, and fail to support alternative. And fail to support alternative. Okay, so if you look at your learning objectives on the outline for these um, stats section, you'll see I think number four has about um, understanding why we don't accept an uh, hypothesis as true or false. And on your papers, if you ever put the word prove, I usually cross it out and say, never use this. We hardly ever prove anything. We just make probability statements, and we're more or less confident about things. Um, so that's why it has this language. And you really need to get used to talking in these different terms. It's like a whole new language in statistics for you. 